Hello, glad you were able to tune in either on Facebook or YouTube uh, or uh, some of these social medias that we're on. And we hope that you will share this with someone else and that you would hit the like button and also subscribe to the channel, please. Uh, we appreciate all that uh, those that are watching it on YouTube. I know many times we get uh, 40, 50, sometimes 90 responses, you know, or at least notifications that somebody and a certain individual is watching perhaps one of the friends on Facebook. But uh, you don't have to be a friend on Facebook to watch this. You could share this with, if you are a friend, and you could share it with someone else, and that would be great. And someone else could hear the gospel. So that's what it's all about. Uh, Jesus gave his disciples a commandment uh, before he left the earth. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. And he says, those that believe uh, shall be saved. Those who believe not shall be damned, condemned. And so uh, you don't have to do a thing uh, to go to hell. Just be born, live your natural life. Um, and if you never accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior in your life, you never recognize him as the Savior that, that give his blood for the redemption of the world, for the sins of the world. If you never acknowledge that and never confess Him as Lord and Savior, then go ahead, you live your life, you die, and that's it, right? No, that's not it. Uh, you will stand in, in uh, judgment before God at the great white throne judgment. And the Bible says also, and that's when all souls will be gathered there at that judgment. But it says, unto man, unman it's appointed once to die, but after death the judgment in Hebrews I believe it is uh, chapter 9, I believe, the last verse or so. But I wanted to continue what we were dealing with last week about how faith works, and faith works by love. We've got quite a bit of response from that. There's so much more here I'd like to bring out to you, if the Lord will help me. <clears throat> now I know that uh, some will argue in, in the church, I'm talking about the body of believers, They'll say, well, tongues is not for today, the gifts of the Spirit and everything. You know, all, they all died with the last apostle, which I can't ever figure that statement out because there's no scripture uh, for that particular statement. In fact, what we're saying is the, what God was able to do to the early church to get it started. And some say, well, that's just to get it started. Uh, well, he continued the early church. The early church continued to operate the gifts all the way through the book of Acts. In fact, these were not the acts of the apostles. This was the acts of the Holy Ghost. So we're talking, the book was dedicated and written about what the Holy Ghost was doing in the church and in believers. So uh, Paul, he got into a lot more. He wasn't one of the original 12 disciples, and he became an apostle, but he wasn't one of the original apostles that Jesus chose. So he come along and he, he pointed out some things, you know, after he was converted on the road to Damascus, and he was uh, actually putting Christians to death because he thought he was doing God a favor. And he had a great deal of knowledge about the Old Testament, but he knew nothing about Christ. And we know this, the, uh, uh, that that day came when he met Christ on the road to Damascus, a great light shone down from heaven, and a voice out of that light and said, Paul, Paul, actually his name was Saul at the time. He said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Why do you kick against the pricks? In other words, you're kicking against something that's not going to move. It's not, you may kill people that believe this and operate in the Holy Ghost, but you are not going to kill the movement. You're not going to kill the Holy Ghost. It's the Holy Ghost at work in people's lives. And he continues to work. He continues to work throughout each generation and will continue until uh, the coming of Christ, which is that day of perfection for the church, the, to gather the church uh, unto himself. And so we read those scriptures last week and talked about charity, uh, how that it never fails. And uh, in verse 8 there of the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians, we call that the love chapter, charity never faileth. 
but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Now, I, I, I see this scripture, I hear this scripture used a lot as an excuse uh, why people don't believe in the gifts of the Spirit today and why they're not for the church today. Charity never faileth. Now, if we have the love of God, it's, you know, we're going to make it. But he said, whether there be prophecy, prophecies, yes, this, they will fail. Whether there will be tongues, they will cease, not have ceased. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. No, it hadn't vanished away yet. God is still using these gifts. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. All of the true original prophecy has been given. In fact, you open the Bible, you're reading the original prophecy uh, that cannot be changed, and it's not conditional. It's, it says what it says, and it means what it means, and that's why we follow the Word of God. Now, if you receive a personal prophecy, someone comes along and a uh, so-called prophet, and they lay hands on you, and they say, Thus saith the Lord, this is what God wants you to do, and that what God would have you to do. I've seen a lot of people in, in the Pentecostal and uh, uh, different ranks like that, you know, charismatic. Uh, they, they sought after the gift so much, they, and they just fell in love with that prophecy gift. And some of them would receive a prophecy from some, some so-called uh, prophet, prophet of God in the church, and they would just, just go hog wild on it. Uh, I knew a man personally, he had a business, a good business, and he received this prophecy, he sold the business, and the prophecy that was given to him was written down by a lady in the church that, who was so-called a prophet of God, and she had written down many prophecies and made a book of them, and then she said, well, when the, I find the person that this prophecy belongs to, I'll give it to them. And so she... Give, give him a prophecy out of this book. She probably didn't even read it. She just gave it to him, and he read it, and it said, you know, God's going to send you all over the world. You're going to preach the gospel uh, in many nations. You're going to, you're going to, uh, miracles are going to happen in your ministry. You're going to raise the dead. These things were literally in that prophecy. And God's going to use it greatly. So he got all excited about it. And he sold everything, and he got ready for it, and things didn't go according as the prophecy said. And, but in the, in the meantime, you know, before he done all this, he came to me and he said, uh, Brother Ron, what do you think about this? He respected me and my ministry and everything. And I looked at the prophecy and, and I read it. I said, Brother, this has no conditions. I said, this here is unconditional prophecy, just like it's the Bible. And, and uh, you can't write any more and put it in the Bible. I said, this prophecy is a conditional prophecy, uh, but I see no conditions here. I see that uh, nothing, nothing here says that if you obey me, uh, if you yield yourself, if you, uh, if you surrender yourself to me, if you continue in my love, in my work, if you do this and if you do that, that's conditional prophecy which is supposedly personal prophecy. But when I hear personal prophecy and there are no conditions there, they're trying to take the place of God's Word. And most of the time, those people will stop reading the Bible and studying the Bible so much they just read this prophecy over and over. Oh boy, I'm going to go all over the world. I'm, I'm going to have a great ministry. I'm going to raise the dead. And, and, they, and they go out believing that instead of continuing to study the Word of God. And you see, you've got to get the Word in you, the living Word. And if you get some prophetic thing, which there are true prophecy gifts in the church. and But personal prophecy, I'm a little bit aware of. And I've received personal prophecy myself. And it came to pass. Uh, every bit of it. But then I've also re received some word of knowledge and things, which a lot of times, you know, it's just something that, God is telling you uh, about, your, about yourself, something God's already been dealing with you, and He uses an individual to give a word of knowledge. And, and, and God has personally used me for things like that. And I'm very careful when that, when that happens. Very careful that I know it's the Holy Spirit of God moving. And because I don't want to get sidestepped. I don't want to, get, I don't want to lead someone else uh, off somewhere in yonder uh, land and... and uh, 
um, dreamland. So we have to be careful about that. So, uh, but the man that I was talking about, he failed, he failed royally, and he was very discouraged about it. His health failed. He concerned himself so much, his health failed. His wife left him, you know, and uh, he, he got married again, and then uh, I think that wife left him too. You know, it was just one tragedy after another. Uh, but he was depending on personal prophecy. You have to be careful. Your, your life could be destroyed if you're, if you're living your life by a personal prophecy. Take it with a grain of salt and say, okay, that's good, brother. I received that. Um, you know, uh, but I just, I'm going to continue in the Word because this is the unconditional prophecy. It's already been fulfilled, many, much of it, and is continuing to be fulfilled right before our very eyes every day, the Word of God. And so, uh, but he said, whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. And yes, sometimes they fail. And it will fail. There will be tongues. They'll cease. And knowledge, it'll vanish away. These are things all, he said, we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Which is perfect. Christ's coming will perfect the church. Amen. Then we won't need these partial gifts. We won't need these. He said, when I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. So we have to mature and grow in the Lord to put away these childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. There's coming a day we're going to see clearly. Right now, we're do, we are seeing through a dark glass. You know, we, we understand some things, but we, we're not totally... Uh, liberated as far as knowledge we still are striving uh, to know more and we seek God for more knowledge and understanding the Bible says if you lack wisdom uh, if any man lacks wisdom let him ask of God who giveth Amen. and he said I now I know in part but then I shall know then shall I know even as also I am known in other words I'm gonna be like everybody's gonna know me and I like to read some of the notes that uh, Dick has, has given on these scriptures here uh, in the, that uh, word, uh, let me let me get back here, which it says, uh, I get the right note here about the prophecies failing. In other words, to make useless or void, abolish, leave, unemployed. <laughs> it is translated fail, vanish away, done away, and put away. Here it is literally. Here it literally means that that when the completeness or communication and knowledge comes, tongues will be no barrier, and partial knowledge will be superseded by the perfect or complete, as it says in verse nine through ten. And men in eternity will be able to speak all the languages of all others in the universe. Thus doing away with present-day language barriers. The partial knowledge will be superseded by perfect knowledge. It is only that which is in part which shall be done away or come to an end. Remember the, the Tower of Babel back in Genesis? God had come down and confused their language because they were building a city that they were saying they were going to reach into heaven and they were going to be like gods. They wanted to be like God himself. And they, they didn't recognize the true God, but they thought they'd get that city high enough that they could be a royalty a God in themselves. And that uh, God come down, he just confused the language. And it was a simple thing to do. None of them could communicate with each other. They left off building, they couldn't understand each other. And so they all left and went their different ways. And the different languages were was uh, formed all over the earth. And it says... Paul further makes clear his meaning here when he compares the next life to something as far advanced over this one as adulthood over childhood. And when he declares that we now see darkly into the future, knowing only a few things, whereas then, face to face with God, we shall know other persons and things as now known by God. 
going to great. Uh, uh, we're going. We're going to uh, receive a great deal of knowledge, and, and there'll be no limit. Knowledge and understanding, and that which has reached an end is prophecies that have been fulfilled have reached an end. Tongues and knowledge will be superseded by a more complete knowledge and means of communications. So he said when he spoke as a child and understood as a child and he thought like a child because he was a child. But when he became a man he put away these childish things. He's talking about spiritual, the spiritual growth of a born-again believer. The Greek for the word put away is katargio, if I pronounced it right. It means the things that cease are to be superseded by, the, by a more complete life along the same lines in the same way that adulthood is so far advanced beyond childhood as to be on another plane entirely. There will be no need of prophecies when we shall know as we are known, as it says uh, in verse 12. He said, but then, he said, now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. So, the no meaning, lack of knowledge, or lack of wisdom, lack, lack of understanding. Uh, everybody's going to understand everybody. And we won't need the the gifts of the Spirit, the prophecies, the, the tongues, the interpretation of tongues, these things, these knowledge gifts. We won't need all of these things because these were given to the church. As Jesus ascended, it's in, I believe it's in the book of Galatians, where Jesus ascended on high, he gave gifts unto men. And he gave gifts to the church. Uh, so at this point, when we reach that point, right now we need prophecies. Right now we need tongues. Right now we need the gifts of the Spirit to operate in our life. In fact, Jude, in the book of Jude, which is only one chapter, verse 20, he said, But beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Now, how do you pray in the Holy Ghost? You pray with tongues. Uh, you pray with a language that you don't know, with a language that the Holy Spirit is giving through you. So you can pray in the Spirit. And if you can pray in the Spirit, you're your spiritual life would be much more effective because the devil don't understand what you're praying. You see, I believe the devil listens to our prayers as well as God. I believe that he, he as long as he can listen, you know, he's, oh, so they want this, they want that. Oh, they want God to do this. Oh, oh so he does, he knows what to work on. He knows what to, what to come against. Hello? Some people say, well, it seems like my prayers are just bouncing between heaven and earth. Try praying in the Spirit. Hello? Try praying in tongues and uh, see what happens. Because you're not praying selfishly. You're praying what the Holy Spirit wants you to pray. As in uh, the 8th chapter, I believe it is, of Romans where he said, Likewise the Spirit helpeth our infirmity, infirmities, for we know not what to pray for as we ought. I believe it's 8, 8 and verse 26. He said, But the Spirit itself uh, is with groanings which cannot be uttered, speaketh with groanings and, and you know, other tongues that spirit comes from the spirit of God. So we know that he is uh, able to do that, speak through us and give us the right words to say. Instead of praying some selfish prayer, some some prayer that, you know, God get them, you know, they met, they done me wrong. I've, I've heard people say, <laughs> some old saints of God, I hope the Lord gets them, puts them and puts a knot on their head, you know, what they done to me. And uh, that's the wrong way to pray. Hello? First of all, you've got unforgiveness in your heart. Hello? And, and, and you've got hatred in your heart. And love's not working there. Uh, and faith works by love, so your faith's not working. Hello? And, and you've lost it all up. You messed it all up because of your hatred and your variance and your old human ways. And you, want, you, affect, you think that you could pray effectively and pray... Lord, send the devil after that person. Lord, just just to just make their life miserable. Well, I know that God can make people's lives miserable. So we need to pray according to the Spirit. And pray much more effectively. Pray a, a true prayer. 
directly to God, no interruption, no interference. The devil can't hear what you're saying. Hello? You say, well, the devil don't listen to our prayers. Oh, yes, he does. And you see, he, he, wants to, he doesn't want us to pray to begin with, first of all. And prayer is a petition toward God. So we should pray in the Spirit so that we give Him the right requests and right petitions before God. Instead of praying selfishly and, uh, you know, for self, hello, and uh, to, so that we may be glorified, we should never pray that we may be glorified. We should always pray that God would be glorified, that His work uh, will be blessed. And that's why it's so important to pray in the Spirit. And so uh, He said... Um, the the words here that he's using there will be no need of the gift of tongues when we shall know all languages and of the universe there will be no need of stumbling around in ignorance with our partial knowledge when we shall have super, super knowledge and complete and perfect insight into eternal things and when he was using the word the mirror the word mirror in verse 12 now we see through a glass, darkly, which is interpreted mirror. Uh, so, you know, when you see through a glass darkly, or when you see through a mirror, you're actually you're looking back at yourself at all. And, you know, I think it's pretty effective. Uh, most people got a big mirror in their bathroom, I do. And sometimes I go in there and I just point the finger at the mirror. I say, you better shave up. You better get right with God. You better stop doing these things and start doing the things that are correct and right and start start uh, start praying more. Many times I to point to that mirror and I say, you need to pray more. You know what? In the mirror, the mirror's pointing right back at me. And so I get it double. Not only in my ears, but I get it, you know, from the mirror. And you say, well, that's kind of silly. Actually, it's not. Actually. Because when we're praying like that, you know, we're praying partially, we're believing God partially, but He's receiving, when we pray in the Spirit, He is receiving uh, a prayer that has not been interrupted, that is not a selfish prayer. He's receiving those prayers in heaven, and He's keeping those prayers. And it talks about it in Revelation that He has a whole big vial, or a big uh, vials of prayers of the saints. At a particular time, He's going to pour those prayers out as as uh, God pronounces judgment on earth. So those prayers will come back and do an effective work. But if you just pray selfishly all the time, your prayers are just going out there in the air. And, and the devil's laughing. So, boy, I pulled a good one on them, didn't I? And they think they're praying. Oh, and some of them will go to church and they'll, they'll, they'll say, so, could you, brother, could you close in prayer? Or brother, could you open in prayer? Our sister, could you lead us in prayer? And they get to pray. Oh, Lord God Almighty, Creator of the universe and all that we see. You know, just pray. <laughs> you don't have to go through all that. If you pray a sincere prayer, the Bible says the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much there in the book of James. Go read it. Chapter 5. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. He talked about, used, the, uh, used Elijah as an example there, how he prayed and it did not rain for the space of three and a half years until he prayed again. And it says, then he prayed again. And he prayed for rain. And it rained. You see, our prayers could be effectual. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So, we should pray uh, proportionately, uh, proportionately, we should pray correctly. He said, uh, this is a dark saying riddle. It's the same as our English enigma. Life is like a riddle. The future state, although somewhat clear from the many revelations about it, is still like a dream. It is hard to realize how wonderful it will be due to our present lack of experience. We shall know each other in heaven and on earth forever. So three things he said, eternally abide, faith, hope, and divine love. Now we're going to cut it off right there. Uh, I see my fellow that's mowing the yard has showed up, and uh, uh, it needs, so he's out there weeding. So God bless you. 
Thank you for listening today. And go with God as He will go with you. Amen. And send for the books. Go on Amazon.com. And i got a whole bunch of new books uh, in this week. If you send for the books, Vietnam Wrecked My Life, I'd like to send you one. And include uh, $5 and, and a few cents for postage. And I'll send you the book. God bless you. Amen.